Coming up on Garden Talk. In a fabric pot situation that doesn't have that living soil liner, we want to bring drippers or emitters, we want to bring them further out towards the edge of the pot generally so that we can keep that edge more consistently hydrated. So as the soil moisture dries out, it dries out this ceramic tip just a bit, and that pulls some of the water that's inside down into the ceramic itself, which creates a negative hydrostatic pressure. If you want that nice, even watering coverage and you know maintaining that upper level of soil very, very moist and consistent, three drippers is, is a good way to go. So the solution to that is PEC acid. There's a product called Drip Clean. That's like super common. Yeah, using that like as directed on the bottles, that'll take care of all those issues. What's happening is the plants is going and grabbing the valve, the water control valve, and now the plant's in control of how it gets watered and when it gets watered. What's up, everybody? If you that don't know me, my name is Chris, a.k.a. Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk podcast. This is episode number 50. 50 episodes deep. Wow. Incredible. Super thankful to all of you who have tuned into these episodes. I'm going to keep them going. Definitely going to keep producing these episodes because many of you have made it clear that you want these episodes to continue. I did this on episode 25 as well, but I think it's important for me to reiterate my vision for this podcast. My vision for this podcast is to talk to growers from all over the world, both beginners and experts, and seek to learn more about what they know about gardening. I'm not gonna judge people for the way that they grow, and this isn't a debate. I'm simply seeking to learn more about the guest and what they know about gardening and how they do things in their garden. My vision is for these conversations to not only just help me expand my knowledge, but you, the listener's knowledge too. So once again, thank you to all of you who are riding along with me on this journey. I truly appreciate it. I'd love to know, who is your favorite guest on this podcast so far? Let me know down in the comment section below. In this episode, I interview Michael Box from Sustainable Village. He has been gardening for over 22 years, and he specializes in plant irrigation. In this episode, he talks about the different methods of auto-watering. He also gets into his recommendations for different size containers. Thanks to all of you who support this podcast through Patreon. If you'd like to support, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash mrgrowit. Before we get into it, I want to acknowledge that one of my goals for this podcast is to bring zero cost for information about gardening, all plants, to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to Spider Farmer for being a sponsor. A new grow light they released here in 2022 is the SE1000W. This was designed specifically for those of you who run CO2 in your grow space and really want to maximize the light intensity. It has a 10 bar design for an even light spread, pulls 1000 watts from the wall, and comes in at 2.9 micromoles per joule efficacy. The recommended coverage area is 4 feet by 4 feet or 5 feet by 5 feet. Use discount code MrGrowIt5 to save on all Spider Farmer products, and I'll leave a link in the video description section below. Thanks to Dutch Pro for sponsoring this podcast. Dutch Pro products are now available in several countries across the world. For those of you that don't know, Dutch Pro is a plant fertilizer company that has base nutrients, additives, and pH regulators. They have different formulas of base nutrients for if you're in soil or if you're in hydro or cocoa. They also formulate their base nutrients for if you're using hard water or if you're using RO or soft water. I will leave a link to Dutch Pro's Amazon store down in the description section below. And you can use coupon code MrGrow10DP for a discount on their products. AC Infinity is a sponsor of the podcast. Coupon code MrGrowIt will get you a discount on their products. I've been using their Cloudline T6 and T4 inline fans for several years now, and I absolutely love the automation built into them. On the inline fans controller, you can have set points for high and low temperature, as well as high and low humidity. This greatly helps control my indoor garden environment, so the temperature and humidity stays in the ideal ranges. I will leave a link to AC Infinity down in the description section below, and don't forget to use coupon code MrGrowIt for a discount on their products. And we are back. Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast. Today I am joined with Michael Box from Sustainable Village. How are you doing today? Uh, great. Really great. It's good to be here. Yeah, glad that you decided to come on. So we know each other from MJ BizCon. Actually, we met, I think it was like three, years, two, three years ago. Yeah, I think in 2019. Yeah, uh, we were. I think you were out there with Chris there that one time. Yep, Chris from Happy Hydro. Uh, yeah. My, uh, he was actually on episode three of this Garden Talk. So. Oh, excellent. Um, yeah, and we've yeah. been working with Chris for a long time, too. He's kind of a friend of the company. 
Um, nice, nice. Yeah. But you know all about irrigation, and that's what we're going to get into today. Really, I think most of my audience is probably home growers. Certainly do have folks on the commercial side of things. I would think more of them are more indoor versus outdoor, but I'm sure we'll talk about things that are relevant towards everybody. Now, one of the things I wanted to get go over in this episode would be the different common container sizes and how the best way to irrigate them is. You know, I know a lot of folks are hand watering right now, but they're interested in actually going to the automated system. So we'll go over, you know, what the different automated systems are, the different options for the different container sizes, so on and so forth. So it should be valuable on that aspect. But, but uh, first, before we get into that, can you give us an introduction? Tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you got into gardening. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, uh, I, I currently well, so I currently work for a Sustainable Village. We're based out of uh, Boulder, Colorado, um, and you know the Sustainable Village has been around for for about twenty years. Um, <clears throat> I've been here in this role as the lead designer and a bunch of other things for probably uh, four years now, and kind of been friends with the company here for a while and the owner for a long time. Um, <clears throat> As far as my own personal background, I I got into working on organic farms as a teenager back in um, Pennsylvania where I grew up, working on organic farms back there. And uh, uh, once I moved out to Colorado in 2000, I uh, was involved with the local farm scene here quite a bit and the permaculture community. I did uh, permaculture design certification about 12 years ago. I've... uh, um, run a market garden here in Boulder County and a, a CSA program and uh, a farmer's market stand um, <clears throat> uh, as part of the farmer's market. And uh, yeah, just, you know, that's some of the background I have. I've just always been an avid gardener, you know, personally, I've done it in commercial settings. Um, you know, I've been in Colorado here for like the last 12 years. You know, there's some newer industries and I've been involved with those as well, as far as the gardening goes. Um, we've been really heavily involved in those industries to be particular. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's a real, real brief background, uh, throughout all that time. I've always been very, very interested in irrigation though. So I don't know. I like water. I like rivers. I like, I like moving water in general. It's just the theme in my life. And, uh, so I, I've always been involved in irrigation design and installation and kind of run my own install design companies. And then, uh, you know, being able to be here at Sustainable Village, for the last while, we've been able to take a lot of, um, well, so at Sustainable Village here, we sell uh, blue mats, uh, which we can get into later, but there are these moisture sensing valves, they're carrots, they're a ceramic carrot, <clears throat> and yeah, we can dive into those and talk about how they work, but what's been really cool here uh, is is to take some of the some of the designs and the strategies people were using, kind of, um, you know, customers were figuring it out on their own, there was R&D happening in the company, and then to take those ideas and really expand them into, um, you know, commercial settings or, or just really easily, uh, um, very modular, easy to replicate systems for the home growers that can easily expand into a large, like a medium system to a very large system. Um, and then <clears throat> from there, we've kind of really branched off the last few years in irrigation and uh, we're doing big ag projects now, you know, 100 acre farms, that sort of thing. Uh, where we're, we're not using blue mats for those, we're more traditional drip irrigation or even some <clears throat> high-powered overhead watering in, in certain circumstances. But um, yes, yeah, it's it's been a real journey of uh, learning and understanding and um, uh, kind of coming to know the whole irrigation in- industry and world uh, for you know for the last couple decades. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, just speaking with you in person, I could tell that you have a ton of knowledge in regards to it, and it's like clearly a passion for you. And in the way you explain it, it just makes things fun, like the way that you get to design different ways to do it. It, it just sounds so fun to me. Yeah, yeah. There's lots of ways to do different things, and it's it's all it's all about finding the most simple, you know, cheapest way to do things. And um, yeah, that's it's a it's a fun puzzle. Yep. So let's talk about grow pots first before we actually dive into the different sizes, right? So plastic grow pots versus fabric grow pots. Can you talk to us about uh, like specifically how it impacts in regards to irrigation? Yeah, um, there's not a lot of difference. So, you know, most of most of the work we do with blue mats and um, is is in containers, right? So we're like you said, we're in you know round pots, 
uh, plastic pots, nursery pots, that kind of stuff, or fabric pots. Um, and then also in all kinds of different raised beds, that's a, a real common, you know, container growing for indoor gardening or greenhouse gardening and stuff like that, people doing large raised beds. Um, <clears throat> there's, not, there's not a big, well, if, we're just, if, we, if we looked at the, raised, the round pots kind of thing, you know, that's, that's one where there's a lot of plastic pots in play, there's a lot of fabric pots in play. Um, you know, the, the, there's, a, there's the product, the uh, grassroots, you know, the grassroots living soil products. I'm a kind of a pretty good proponent of those. Um, <clears throat> they're, a, they're a fabric pot with a, a non-permeable liner that, you know, that's about 8 or 10 inches deep. Um, so it gives a, like, non-breathable uh, layer on the upper part of it. You know, so the, one of the big problems we see with irrigating um, fabric pots in general is they dry out kind of in an uneven way. The edges, like the couple inches near the edge of the of the fabric, um, tend to dry out much faster than the, the rest of the, the soil mass. <clears throat> so uh, roots tend not to colonize that outer edge as densely as, as they would in even in a plastic pot where moisture is able to be held right up to the edge. Now, <clears throat> fabric pots are actually, but they're also very handy, right? They're light, lightweight. You can ship them really easily. They're, you can kind of reuse them pretty well. And so that's, again, that's, we come back to those, those grassroots pots. I really like those for being able to hold moisture right up to the edge of the pot, um, and, but, not, uh, but still have kind of a lot of convenience of a fabric pot, or particularly in the fabric raised beds when we see those because they can do big ones and you know, set them up really quickly without a bunch of carpentry. Um, yeah, so really, I guess the, the thing to think about is, you know, if we're in a raised bed, or sorry, in a, in a fabric pot situation that doesn't have that living soil liner, we want to bring <clears throat> our water distribution, whatever drippers or emitters, we want to bring them further out towards the edge of the pot generally, um, so that we can keep that edge, uh, more consistently, uh, hydrated. Um, but, but really, I mean, not a, not a ton of difference. Um, as far as how we're gonna how we're gonna irrigate, like if we're looking at a five gallon pot, it's really not gonna be that much different between a, a plastic nursery pot or a, or a fabric pot. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. Now let's let's go over some of these grow pot sizes. We'll start with just a one gallon pot, right? So we have folks that are using just one gallon pots. Maybe they just have one plant in one pot. Yeah. What would you say the optimal way to to irrigate that would be? Would it be like a blue mat classic? And then what if they were to have like multiple one gallon pots? So just an individual yeah. one versus a multiple ones. Right. Well, I think um, in order to answer that, I just want to explain blue mats a little bit. Sure. And, and what they are and how they work. Yeah. So what what they are is they're they're moisture sensing valves, and you know I have one here. I just pulled it out of a plant, so it's got some dirt on it and stuff. But you know they they have a a screw cap here, um, so they, they're empty. Um, when you get them like this, they have this <clears throat> silicon line. It's a three millimeter uh, silicon line that goes through the top. They have this little brown dial um, on the top as well, and that kind of helps you adjust, adjust moisture content. But essentially what you do with these is you fill them with water. Uh, there's a little process for that, <clears throat> um, and seal them. So now they have a sealed, uh, there's a sealed cone full of water. And then this whole cone is buried in the soil um, right up to the, you know, so that the ceramic tip, uh, the ceramic tip of the cone is completely uh, buried and, and seeded snugly into the soil. And, and what happens actually is we, so we charge one end of this line um, with uh, a constant pressure. So one end of this, this water line will be a constant, uh, anywhere between about 2 and 15 PSI is the range we want to work in. And that's 24 hours a day we have uh, a pressurized line all the way up to um, to the point where the where the tube passes through the carrot, and um, because the carrot's also a valve, and it's controlled by the soil moisture. So as the soil uh, moisture dries out, it, it dries out this ceramic tip just a bit, and that pulls some of the water that's inside down into the ceramic itself, which creates a negative hydrostatic pressure, negative water pressure inside the cone, and that pulls against a little membrane here, which opens a valve uh, in the top and allows water to flow through that tube and then um, drip out the other end of that tube. And you can either have that drip out <coughs> directly, uh, directly out of this tube into the pot or through a series of distribution drippers 
or we have a, a really cool soaker hose material um, <clears throat> called Blue Soak. It's, a, it's made out of medical grade Tyvek. Um, it's, it's really pretty durable. You treat it right, and um, it gives very, very even, slow water distribution. So we can do up to a couple hundred feet of that downstream of one of these. <clears throat> so to answer your question um, about the best way to irrigate you know, a, a one-gallon pot, um, the, the other type of, of blue mat product there is that you mentioned is the classic. Um, I have some here kind of just in, my, in the plants here in my office. And really what these are, let's see here, is... Uh, these are a little different. If you can see this here, these guys are—they just have a, a a hose connected right to the top, but doesn't pass through. And one end of this tube has a, like a weight a weight on it, and that weighted tube just gets dropped into a, a pitcher of water, and then the cone itself gets buried in the soil here, and it actually just siphons water up um, from the <clears throat> uh, from the from the pitcher of water into there, and it's kind of an even flow rate. So if you're doing a lot of small plants, like, you know, one gallon size plants, one of those classics would work. Um, I know people who want to do, <clears throat> they're doing a lot of uh, uh, <clears throat> clone propagation for whatever they're growing. They, they might, when they transplant those clones into smaller pots, um, they'll use, you know, maybe you have a whole bunch of them. Maybe you get, you know, tw you know, 20, 50 of these in small pots. Having a whole bunch of carrots can work for that. Um, definitely done that. I've used that technique myself. Um, but if you're if you're growing, so that's like would be like a veg, like a plant that's in a vegetative state. If you were flowering a plant out, um, you might want to do it in a. <clears throat> um, you might need a little bit more water to do that. So having the adjustable flow rate that comes with the, with the trope blue mat is probably what you want in a circumstance like that. Um, you know things for that are geared towards production. The tropes work good because they really, really meet the plant's need wherever they are. Um, house plants, the Blue Mat Classic's an excellent choice to uh, keep all your house plants, you know, nice, evenly watered and such. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, a one-gallon pot, any, it could go anywhere from just one Blue Mat uh, trope to or one classic, and that's all I would do. I wouldn't use any distribution drippers or anything like that. Okay, and you mentioned a specific PSI that needs to be fed to the regular blue mat carrot. I don't want people to worry about measuring that because it's just really it's gravity fed, right? So you just as long as it's above, you know, hooked up to a reservoir, and as long as it's above the pots, is that how high it needs to be? And then it will yeah, gravity for the feed down that system, pretty much provides yeah. enough PSI. Right. So just to give you guys a um, a little context, um, so you know. PSI, it's a unit of, it means pounds per square inch, it's just a unit of pressure. Um, and um, so if you have a, a container that's, uh, so 2.31 2 feet of vertical head, right, equals 1 PSI. So the, gra you know, the gravity pressure from 2.31 is, is enough to, is, an, is really enough, uh, 1 PSI is enough just to, if you're just dripping right out of a tube, it's enough to run that. Um, and, and yeah, it's absolutely right. With blue mat systems in general, we can run them a few different ways. We can run them <clears throat> uh, off of gravity. So have a reservoir that's, you know, on a shelf, and then that's providing the, the gravity is just providing the pressure, that constant pressure. Um, also, we can have, we have a pressure reducer that just screws onto a, a hose bib. That's a 15 PSI pressure reducer. Uh, you screw that on your hose bib and then have the hose bib open, and it's just all your lines in your system will then be charged at... Uh, at 15 psi all the time, um, and we also have we build pump kits. So if you have a reservoir that's on the ground that maybe you want to mix nutrients into or something like that, um, <clears throat> you can do that and then just pump out of that. And then we keep the lines uh, pressurized with a, a little pump that has a pressure switch and a pressure accumulator tank and then a pressure reducer. So we're able to uh, uh, kind of you know maintain a constant pressure just pulling out of a reservoir with a small Kind of like almost pre-assembled pump kit that comes that we can that we offer here at the Sustainable Village. Um, those are kind of the three ways to uh, <clears throat> provide that back end pressure: either gravity, uh, a hose bib, you know, or or a pump kit. Gotcha. All mine are gravity fed. I've had the Blue Mac carrots go to three gallon containers, five gallon containers, and seven gallon containers. I actually, running seven gallon containers right now for three gallon grow pots. 
let's move on to that. What's the optimal irrigation method for it? Would you put one carrot in there, two carrots in there, or what would you do? Yeah, you know, again, I, I would stick with just the one carrot and, and no drippers probably. I mean, a three-gallon three, a three gallon pot, like what is that, like a maybe an eight- or nine-inch diameter pot or something like that? Um, that's um, – uh, It can be more than that, I think. It's yeah. probably like roughly 12 inches, I would say. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, you're getting to a point – you know, with, with all these like, uh, you know, smaller pots, like pots under say 30 gallons, really one carrot per pot is all you really need. I mean, in the past people have wanted to do more and you can, and there, and there's, there's some, there's some advantages to adding, adding more carrots, but really for, you know, I just like wanted to see things work well for people and, you know, improve plant health, improve yield, that sort of thing. And, you know, they can do that, um, <clears throat> Uh, really well with just like one five inch carrot and 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 the series of, of distribution drippers so um, I don't have any sitting right here but um, basically what we can do is with this three inch tubing we can connect these little distribution drippers that just go in line and make a and make a, a chain of them um, <clears throat> they're different than like a drip emitter like a pressure compensating drip emitter but there's but they're similar in their idea um, <clears throat> so you could have like the carrot, and then when it, the carrot opens and, and it waters and it turns on, um, it drips in like you know, two places or three places or five places. So, you know, going going up from the three gallon, five gallon, you know, five gallon pot, um, <clears throat> or even a three, you know, I would I would go with like probably a carrot, and then, you know, if you want to do it cheap and easy, you can just do one. You just have it drip right out. But if you want that nice even watering coverage and, you know, maintaining that upper level of soil very, very moist and consistent. You know, three drippers is, is a good way to go. Um, and we, uh, we mount those drippers on little stakes so they sit up above the soil. They kind of drip down on the soil. And, um, yeah, I don't know if anybody's – there's a lot of, like, we get these, like, root porn pictures. <laughs> People send us all the time where there will be, like, a dripper – it's like, you know, maybe three inches above the stake and then and the plants are just like have built a giant mound of roots and they're kind of just, you know, tentacling their way up to the dripper. Oh, um, yeah, I've seen that. People's yeah. drippers have gotten clogged before that way, right? Oh, yeah. Well, that's when we started putting them on the stakes because we would lay them on the soil and the roots would just kind of go into them and just get all up in there. So we have we need to we need to keep them away from the hungry plants um, a little bit there to. But yeah, that's that's pretty cool to see that kind of action. It, it, you know, it really speaks to the kind of sensitivity with the bloom out systems, because, you know, with these with these plants, like, you, if, say we're growing a, a plant indoors for, you know, three months or something like that, <clears throat> um, and at the end of that three month growing cycle, I might I'll pull the carrot out and look in the hole, and the hole is nothing but, it's just white. It's all white roots. So that so after a while the plant grows its roots all around the ceramic cone, and there's not actually any soil touching it anymore. In, instead, it's just it's just uh, root tips have have grasped this this valve, and and really then the plant is the one that's operating the control because I mean you, the you know the root exudates they can they ba they basically create negative uh, pressure fields and, and pull you know material in from the soil, and they're able to do this they can actually exert negative pressure. Um, against that so the, the what's happening is the plants is going and grabbing the valve the water control valve and now the plants in control of how it gets watered and when it gets watered um, so it's physically turning the water valve on and off whenever it wants a drink um, so that that's pretty cool <laughs> i think that is pretty cool yeah I want to talk about some other auto watering options as well. You know, folks that are watching this, we, we've been introduced to Blue Mats, right? You know, you work for Sustainable Village. Don't want people calling this out as an hour long infomercial. <laughs> there are other options out there. Can you kind of just talk to us about like how they work? For example, the auto pot system. That's something I've had before where, you know, it's, it's, it's down below drip irrigation systems, pump systems. Can you just talk about like some of the other options out there? Yeah. Um, I don't know too much about the auto pots. I've never used them personally. They're kind of like a like a product, and I know you have to buy like special pots and special trays and yep, uh, yep. But I think they basically there's like a water tray at the bottom that's filled by a little float valve, and then there's like a wicking action that happens. Um, 
Exactly. Yeah, I've heard people have good luck with them. I know that they, <clears throat> yeah, I think one of the, uh, just one of the downsides is you have to use these these special containers that they they have. Um, but I've heard people get really good results with them too. Um, <clears throat> but then, you know, besides that, like there's hand watering, of course. And, you know, that's not, it's not that bad. Like to, it's, there's nothing wrong with hand watering. So people have been watering plants for a really, really long time. Um, and, you know, especially if we're just talking about like home gardens and, you know, backyard gardens or indoor gardens and things like that, smaller scale stuff, you can totally get away with hand watering. I'm sure we've all done that. Um, at different times, <clears throat> done some hand watering. Uh, I've done lots of it, um, and you know, there's, the downfalls of that are it takes a lot of time, is is the main thing, and you're putting a lot of human subjectivity into it, which um, isn't like always, you know, as high quality <laughs> as it could be. Um, you know, people make mistakes, is my point, and and errors, and. And uh, forget to water, and and then overwater. You know, overwatering in general is a really big problem. It's probably the worst problem um, that <clears throat> you might have with uh, uh, irrigation in general. Um, you know, with like house plants, it's like something like eighty percent of all problems with house plants people experience are are overwatering. So, um, <clears throat> and, and, you know, it makes sense. People like want to, they want their plants to do well. They think that like. Uh, you know, water equals love for the plants, and so they're just like give them lots of love and give them lots of water, but it's too much. Um, they want just that right amount so that your soil doesn't get uh, oversaturated. Um, there's a lot of things, you know. There's a lot of downsides that can happen when when too much water is in the plant. The the um, the, the root exudates will seal up. They won't they won't absorb any more water, um, and that means they're not absorbing any more nutrients at the same time. Uh, it can be really detrimental for the soil health too, as far as the microorganisms in the soil, if there's if there's too much water, and it can even you know go on to create <clears throat> different pathogens, you know, different pests, and as or as well as just like anaerobic bacterial conditions uh, in the soil that you know are generally want to avoid. Um, <clears throat> the other the big thing as far as automated irrigation is drip irrigation. So you know, lots of people have used drip irrigation, and it's there's tons of really amazing um, applications for that. It was kind of started getting, I think it was developed in like late 50s, early 60s in Israel. They started coming out with it. Um, and then a lot of those technologies came to the States in the 70s. And, and since then, it's really blown up into this huge, you know, multi-billion dollar global industry of uh, manufacturing irrigation parts, uh, drip irrigation parts. And those can look anything, you know, from like the uh, just kind of basic drip emitters uh, that are like punched into half inch poly tubing, or um, a lot of people see you see, uh, um, you know, they'll connect in a lot of indoor gardens. You see these systems where there'll be like a main line, and then there'll be some sort of emitter with multiple lines coming off of it, and, and stakes that go into pots. Um, you know, those things. All those those systems definitely work, and and really for like outdoor stuff. If you're doing anything outdoors, just doing standard drip irrigation, you know, I did that for years. Um, <clears throat> I mean, it if you're providing regular, consistent water, it's not that's not too much, you know, it's enough. Um, it's it's definitely better than nothing than doing it's to, than doing nothing at all. Um, you know, you want to be sensitive to environmental conditions. So like, if you're on a timer and you get a bunch of rain, like you have to turn the timer off or whatever um, if you don't have some sort of you know moisture sensing control um, that, that's going to account for that um, and then just adjusting flow rates as plants get bigger and, and providing more inputs but yeah just you know traditional drip irrigation works really good the, pro the, pro the problem with it is um, one it's not very sensitive it doesn't have the same sensitivities uh, like it's just going to water the same amount every day if it's on a timer and then, <clears throat> and two, it can be a little tricky getting uniform water distribution. So, you know, you have to size your pump with the flow rates that you're putting out into the system or your pump or your hose or, you know, you have to have enough flow and pressure to uh, operate the system uh, in a uniform way. So, you know, again, there's just some, some things that need to happen with that uh, as far as planning that out and designing it. So at home, you know, you can usually just do stuff, you know, fine. If you're doing your home gardens, 
um, if you start to get on in the scale at all, it's nice to have a designer come in and um, design the system for you and do the engineering behind it because those systems do require some actual engineering as far as, um, <clears throat> you know, again, understanding, you know, things like friction loss and, and flow and pressure. I don't know. <laughs> kind of, gotcha. I kind of go all over the place here, and we can talk about little systems or big systems. But and there's and there's different. It's like different strategy. Like different different goals have different strategies. That's the main thing. It's like what are you growing? What you know? What size container are you in? Uh, what is your environment like? And um, you know, taking that information and <clears throat> uh, applying different strategies, finding the strategy or the technique that's going to best match up what you're trying to achieve is um, that's kind of what we do over here but like that anybody can do it too um, you know just need to do a little homework as well. gotcha yeah I can see how those all the variables would certainly impact it right let's get into five gallon grow pots I think you touched on five gallon grow pot when we were talking about the three gallon grow pot was it one carrot I think you mentioned on that or you could do like the one carrot, but have it come out in several different areas so you get more distribution across that? Yeah, you know, I think um, we, uh, you know, I like to think about things like uh, good, better, best, you know, a lot of times, like what's the, what's the economy version? What's the mid-range version? What's the deluxe version? And, you know, for a five-gallon pot, it's pretty much, you know, just have one dripper point would be your real base level economy. It keeps the plant alive, keeps it pretty healthy. And maybe it's not in there for the like, whole life of the plant. Maybe it's just for like a, you know, a period of vegetative growth, and then you're going to transplant it into something larger. <clears throat> um, but if it's, if it's, that's its forever home or whatever, like I would go, you know, three or five drippers, just depending on what, you know, how much coverage you want to do. And really like how many plants you're going with, because a lot of this stuff, it's just, it's all about like scalability. So if you've got six plants at home, you can really just like, you got, why not go deluxe? Like you're going to have these six really lovely big plants. Um, and they're just for you and your friends or whatever. And, but if you're trying to, if you've got 500 five gallon pots, you know, it's, it's maybe you don't need quite the deluxe version on every one of them. You can do something a little bit more commercial, uh, economic, that kind of thing. Do you have a recommendation for like reservoir size per container or something like that? Like I was running three of them. And uh, I had this massive reservoir. It was sent to me. It was like it was kind of a little silly having like a 64 gallon reservoir, something crazy like that. Actually, I think it was like a 32 gallon reservoir. But like, I only needed like five, seven, five to seven gallons because off of like three plants and three gallon containers. Yeah. Do, well, is there like a general recommendation you know, for like reservoir it, size? Yeah, it really depends on so many different factors. A lot of it has to do with like how many plants are you watering, and like how big are the plants. Um, and what size containers they are. So with like five gallon pots, you know, if, if you're growing plants in there, say in an indoor environment, that's, you know, warm, you know, it's in the high seventies or something like that or whatever. Um, and there's a lot of transpiration and whatnot, you know, you might, you might have a big plant in there. You, you could figure that it could go up to a half gallon a day of water could be used in that five gallon pot. So that's kind of one way to think about it. If you're relying purely on like a gravity fed situation, um, which works again, works great for that, like six to 12 plant kind of thing. Um, and then pressurized systems tend to work a little better for, for larger systems. Um, and by pressurized, I mean like with a hose bib or a pump, um, <clears throat> the, uh, yeah, as far as flow rate and container size, you know, it's all about how, how often do you want to refill it. So if I had a 32 gallon, I would, I mean, I, I like having a big reservoir. Um, uh, and, and, you know, because you don't have to refill it as often. <laughs> it's really the main thing. Um, and a lot, or you can have a small reservoir and you can have a float valve on it. So, you know, um, as soon as you use some of that water, the float valve kicks on and, and keeps itself topped off. Because um, it's another thing to think about when using blue mats and, and gravity is, <clears throat> like, if you have a big reservoir that's tall, like, say it's, like, five feet tall, when that thing's full, it's going to have, you know, a couple PSI more than when it's almost empty of pressure. And these, the carrots are set to, like, a relative pressure sensing. So they're, you, you can get some inconsistency if you have a very tall reservoir that you fluctuate from filled to, full to empty. Um, if you do have a larger reservoir, we always recommend when people are setting the carrots, they fill the reservoir, like, halfway and then they set it. 
and then fill it the rest of the way. So you're kind of getting that median uh, pressure that you're going to find is when, you're, when you're dialing in the carrots. Um, but yeah, I, I like having them. I like the I like having a small one on some sort of uh, uh, float valve, and that float valve, the f supply line of that float valve, doesn't even have to be on all the time. You can have that on a timer or two, for, for for instance. So like, say you had just a five gallon bucket as your reservoir, and you had a bunch of plants. Maybe a couple times a day, the timer kicks like a timer kicks on and charges the water line up to that uh, float valve, and then the float valve, you know, is if it's open, it o it's open and it fills and shuts off. And then, it, and then the timer turns off and it depressurizes. And that way you don't have a pressurized line like you know, running through your house or whatever all the time because that can be a little um, you know, scary or whatever. It's just a little, there's a little risk having pressurized water lines inside. I hear you. I, and you mentioned the five gallon bucket. I was going to say that, you know, for most home grow applications, people who are growing maybe, maybe six plants or less can get away with a five gallon bucket, right? Yeah. Typically you'll put, you know, four, you know, top it off to five gallons of water in there and it's going to take a little while for them to eat through it. So you could just go in there every day and just add in water if needed, you know? So I currently have a, like I bought a trash bin and it's like a 14 gallon trash bin and I yeah. use that. And I don't fill it up all the way. You know, I have it filled up probably maybe five gallons at a time. So I could potentially downgrade for, for my particular scenario. But certainly I feel like folks can get away with running, you know, carrots right to a five-gallon bucket. Do you sell the reservoir too or do you just sell the piece that kind of connects to it, right? Uh, we sell a lot of buckets. So like one of our more popular products is just is like our bucket kits. So it'll be, it'll be a reservoir with the bulkheads dr drilled into it. And then like packed inside of it, you know, is like enough for like six or 12 plants and all the tubing and supply line and that sort of thing. And um, so that like that whole kit, like a bucket with all the components, it's like a standalone kit. It's really nice for someone that wants to test out blue mats or something like that and try them out. Um, we sell those. We, we also sell some other reservoirs, but not once we get, I don't do a lot of the big, large ones. You kind of need like a... Anyways, we're just not really set up to sell really large uh, reservoirs. We have some cool stackable ones that go anywhere from like forty-five to three hundred gallons. But yeah, I don't get in, I don't get into the, like the cisterns, the you know multi-thousand-gallon cisterns and stuff like that. One of, you know one of the things we see people use all the time is just the the IBC tote. Um, like uh, it's you've, I'm sure you've seen them. They're they're on like a pallet, like a pallet skid with a metal cage around it. And they're about 275 gallons. Oh, yeah. Like yeah. Super common. They're cheap. Like, you can pretty much find those in any, like, town, city in America. Like, they have them. You can buy them for, you know, 100, 150 bucks or something. And uh, <clears throat> uh, those make pretty good, you know, they're cheap, easy water reservoirs. Is, you want to make sure you get a food grade or something, one that was had, like, food grade materials in it and not, like, motor oil or something. But, um, yeah, that's... Uh, those are those are great easy reservoirs for larger systems. Or you can if you if they're sitting on the ground, you can pump out of them as well. I currently run, have seven gallon pots. And that's what we'll talk about next. I have two carrots going in each one. So you, you've got the the plant in the middle, right? The stalk in the middle, and then a carrot on each side. Do you think that is sufficient for that, or would you go a different route to irrigation on a seven gallon, or what? No, I mean, like I said, like you, one carrot is probably fine. It's, it's fine. Two is nice, and we have different size. There's different size carrots too, right? There's a that was this is a five inch here, but I but I also have a nine inch carrot, um, so we can measure different soil depths. So a lot of times when we're using multiple carrots in a container, we're using different size ones, so we're measuring different soil uh, levels. Um, so if one one of those moisture levels dries out, uh, there's you know water's applied to the plant. So yeah, oh, no, that's okay. fine. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, there's no, like, there's not a wrong way or a right way to do stuff. There's there's like good ideas and that, that work, you know, more efficiently. There's there's other ideas that are um, give even like give a little bit more edge on performance, but might be a little more complicated. Um, <clears throat> the yeah, I, I guess the way I look at things, I, I tend to look at things on like a larger scale a lot of the time. So I want to, I want things. I don't like to overbuild the systems we design. I want them to just to work like just right and, um, and to approach it more. So, you know, there's this whole market of like indoor, you know, 
medicinal plant cultivation, then then there's usually everything's expensive that goes along with that, right? Like the fertilizer might if you're using that same fertilizer to like grow vegetables versus medicinal plants, you might uh, it's it's going to be like drastically more expensive, and there's like it's like a tax that's put on there. So th that's the case for a lot of the big commercial drip irrigation systems that we see. I see people putting in and they're overbuilt, they're overly complicated. And if we take the um, principles and kind of like ethos of how to irrigate at an, on an ag level, like if you think you're like, imagine you're like a beet farmer or something, like your margin is super, super tight. So it really makes a lot of, you have to just do things as, not as cheaply as possible, but like as efficiently and economically as possible. And there's ways to take those principles and, and irrigate you know, the indoor, there are common indoor plants that get cultivated at scale uh, and um, and do it, like, much more efficiently and economically uh, if, if you use those kind of ag principles for irrigation um, instead of, like, you know, specialized, like, kind of lots of, lots of bells and whistles, hydroponics kind of style irrigation. I think one of the main concerns for folks is the medium drying out. And, you know, that's one thing when you're growing organically, you need to have a moist medium at all times or else the microbes aren't going to be active. And, uh, and oh, my yeah. viewers hear me say this all the time, the amendments aren't going to get broken down and you could run into deficiencies. I feel like I'm kind of running into a problem right now having two drippers in a seven gallon. The top layer still kind of isn't moist at all times. Even, you know, when you top dress in organic nutrients, the area right where the dripper is, is moist. You can clearly see it. But like behind the dripper is like dry and you know how does how do is there a better way to go about it you know what i mean should i have a soaker hose in there for example in a seven gallon in order to help ensure moisture i don't like to use that soaker hose till maybe like a 15 gallon pot or something like that okay um it's just it tends to you're gonna be better off with the drippers um you know to your point about using uh, dry organic nutrients or dry nutrients at all. Um, there's a technique we like to use sometimes. Um, we call it the nutrient well. And, you know, the idea being if you have a, a dripper and your carrot's controlling a series of dripper, um, you know, some of them might drip right into the soil, but they're going to be suspended over the soil and they're going to be dripping onto the, onto the soil. So if you had a, a dry amendment, one thing you can do is actually carve out like a little hole um, and fill that with like don't you know with a with the pure nutri like dry nutrient mix or something like that, um, you know like used to still use this stuff Growilla a lot. I liked that for a while, but it's like you know there's there's lots of other Doctor Earth's a big one. It's a really similar kind of one I've been using lately. But there's um you know they're just like mixes of all these like really good bone meal and blood meal and they'll, you know alfalfa and all kinds of cool stuff. They and and. If you have if you have this kind of well of that dense nutrients and you have a dripper right on top of it, you're gonna you're gonna every time it waters, it's gonna drip right on that nutrient well and kind of just you know it's almost like not really time release but kind of it's sort of every time it waters, you're getting this this little bit of a flush into that nutrients and you might not want that <clears throat> for um, every spot but on a seven gallon pot you're, it's still a relatively small container and um, you know, the plant's going to be able to uptake a lot of those nutrients. Your point about soil drying out and nutrients not being available, I mean, that is, that's like almost the most important thing around thinking about how to irrigate plants. Um, and, <clears throat> yeah, it all has to do with that, 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 that ecosystem that's created in the soil. Um, all those microorganisms, if it gets too dry, they're going to go dormant. If it gets too wet, they're going to go dormant. But if you're able to, to hold them in that, it's, we call it hydro neutral zone, like Goldilocks zone, right? Not too dry, not too wet. Um, they're they're not going to go dormant as often, and whatever their job is, whether it's solubilizing phosphorus or fixing nitrogen or transferring nutrients or whatever, like they're going to do that, all, like twenty four hours a day, instead of um, you know only when the op, you know when the when the soil moisture conditions are optimal for it. So yeah, I mean, I really. I'm glad you're telling your your listeners that because um, it's very, very true. I'll have to try out the nutrient well method that you mentioned. I mean, I kind of did when I top dressed. The, the problem is it's so much, right? Like I'm using a cup 
a build a soil craft blend and like putting that into a seven gallon container in two spots plus worm casting that's like yeah. it's hard to keep it all in one area and i'm yeah. also afraid of like digging down in that area where the roots are already established to create that yeah. well so i don't know if the well is created like in the beginning when you first plant or what another thing you do if you're using blue mats is you can still top dress liquid inputs so you know if you have your blue mat system set up it's all dialed in it's maintained as moisture if you go through and either like mix up a liquid nutrient and pour it over the top or put a dry nutrient mix into the surface and kind of just scuff it in with your fingers just a little bit and then take, you know, your a wand or, you know, some water and water that in, that's fine. The blue mat itself is going to just turn off and it'll just stay off until the, the soil moisture is dried down to that optimal level that you've, you've set it to, to maintain. So, um, yeah, I mean, again, like, in, in big, like, living soil, you know, grows that we, we see, there are a lot of, like, raised beds, right? And with, with those, you know, all this, this, they have this wonderful soil mixes and stuff. And, um, <clears throat> but we, we'll, only run, we'll only run water through the blue mats, and if they want to top dress in inputs like a compost tea or something, we'll just come through the greenhouse, like, once a week or whatever and have, like, a nutrient vat mixed up somewhere, a little day tank, you know, day mix tank put whatever they want to put in there, you know, their, and a small sump pump and a, and a garden hose and a wand and just, you know, top water in whatever they want to feed it. It's really not that much water going in generally, so um, it doesn't really affect the moisture level. It's only a few gallons generally, you know, per raised bed or whatever. But that's sort of standard operating procedure for uh, <clears> those, <throat> like, more commercial living soil um, applications that are in raised beds. They'll run just plain water through the through the irrigation system or through the blue mats. And then you prevent things from, you know, like building up, like you, because you, you can run nutrients and liquid inputs through blue mats or, or drip irrigation um, in general, but you have to uh, kind of account for like biofilm buildup or if you're running synthetic nutrients and you have like salt buildups, mineral buildups. Um, and, uh, and, and there's, that's fine. You just, there's some products you can use to treat that and, and break up the, the buildup that's happening and flush the lines, or you can use them, you know, kind of prophylactically as a, um, <clears throat> throughout the growth cycle. But, um, yeah. Okay. So if you water in compost teas or sometimes I'll, I'll do a mix of or like a microbial inoculant and then I'll water it in. I shouldn't be taking them out or anything like that. Do the blue mats need to be recalibrated at any point? Only if you let the soil dry out really significantly so that it actually dries. Cause if you get the soil really dry, it'll, it'll pull the moisture out here. And once this inside of the carrot um, loses enough water, its ability to turn on and off that valve uh, diminishes. So then we, then we can have errors, like we call them runaways. It's like, it's like the main thing that goes wrong with blue mats is they'll overwater sometimes because of, there's some sort of <clears throat> issue and it's a very short list of like troubleshooting to figure out what that is. Um, but one of them could be if the carrot dries out and there's a, large air bubble in the top uh, it won't doesn't have enough pressure to operate the valve and close it when it needs to yeah okay now what if your reservoir kind of dries out it drops all the way down to the level to where the you know the hose is connected to the reservoir if the water level drops below that and it's no longer getting water to the carrots what will happen the carrots will just dry out yeah it just depends on how long that's going on for so if the you know, if your reservoir goes dry and whatever, it's like a day, it's probably fine. But if it's, you know, five days or something, again, it's all about just like, you know, you, and you can check too. Like sometimes, you know, if your carrot's buried in the soil and, and, you, and the soil's like really dry or something's gone wrong, like, you know, the water supply turned off somehow and you want to know, you can always just like, you take, pull one carrot up and just sort of tip it upside down, see if you see a big air bubble in it. And if there's, if there's a good size air bubble, but not like, uh, you know, but it's still it's still moist. You know, there's still some water in there. You can really kind of get away with just having a bucket with you, and and, and you don't have to re-soak it. You can just unscrew it, have a bucket, stick both your hands under the water in the bucket, and reseal it, and then you know place it back in there. And you don't have to go through the whole like soaking process. It just just to top off the carrot. Um, <clears throat> so yeah. That's, okay, that's yeah. good to know. But no, I mean really, once you dial them in, they should maintain for the for the full uh run yeah that's one thing i like about it is 
kind of, I won't say set it and forget it, but set it and just keep the reservoir full, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah, I've got all my like kitchen gardens and stuff set up at home, all my raised beds and grow my produce and stuff and whatever else. And it's like, man, I'll, you know, in May or June, I'll go out there and turn on the whole irrigation system and like go through and spend a day or two getting everything dialed in and fixed up and re-soak the carrots. And, and then it's like, I don't touch it until like I start ripping it apart, you know, taking it down in October. So. That makes sense. Now there has been times where I got the proper moisture level that I felt, right? I actually water, and then the next day is when I I add the blue mats in, right? Yeah, that's, a good um, that's typically what my plants seem to like it the most is to wait a day and then add them in. Yeah. But there has been times where I, you know, I, I dial them in, and then I come back twenty four hours later and I see one of the drippers constantly dripping. Is that a problem, or is it just working as normal? I mean, it's, you know, they take, con they do take some tuning, right? Generally, once they're, you can kind of, you can do that set them and forget it thing. Like you, once you get them dialed in, maybe it takes you like a week or so to get it dialed in from once you put it in, or maybe even two weeks to like for really nail it. And then it's fine for the whole rest of the growth cycle. Um, and, and that gets faster and faster the more you use them too, because, you know, once you get kind of adept at tuning them, you can almost like feel the tension point when you're tightening them up. Um, that you want to maintain in that. But if you see something dripping and the soil is wet, it's too wet, or you don't want it to wet, I mean, you should dial it back. You know, make the adjustment for sure. Okay, gotcha. Because, you know, things can happen. Like, they can get bumped um, in different ways where you don't notice it, but, like, you bump the pot or something like that. And it, it maybe it – because that's something that I – mean, like, if, if, if these carrots are buried and they get jostled and then, like, all of a sudden the – they're not flush up against the soil, the ceramic part. If there's air up against the ceramic, then the carrot reads as dry. It reads it as very, very dry. So then it's gonna, the valve's gonna open up and it's gonna overwater. So if these things get like bumped a little bit, sometimes um, they can, they can cause. The, that's like the other, you know. I said there's a pretty short list of troubleshooting if you're seeing overwatering and you know, uh, one's the air bubbles inside, the other is like something happened to the carrot where like you know a person or a dog or a clumsy employee or somebody like hit it or you know touched it in some way that, that made it over water okay speaking of problems is salt buildup ever a problem like particularly when using the synthetic fertilizers since with blue mats are, there is no runoff right so like is there do you recommend like a flush to happen or multiple flushes to happen throughout the grow when growing oh, medicinal salt or... buildup in the soil yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, sure. Uh, obviously, that's like a downside, right, of um, of the synthetic program. But what we recommend is if, if someone's doing like a straight like cocoa salt type grow, right, so they're just running synthetic nutrients into their, their plants with some sort of soilless medium, um, uh, kind of like, the, you know, the traditional wisdom is you flush that at the end of the growth cycle, to, you know, to get a lot of that salt out. Uh, and, and additionally, whenever you water, you tend to water until there's a significant amount of runoff, right? So you water until there's X amount of runoff, and that runoff is just those liquid nu nutrients you just bought at the grocery store for a lot of money. It's going right down the drain. But um, <clears throat> so with the blue mats, we don't see that drain to waste. Uh, we don't see that runoff happening because everything that goes in the pot stays there. And <clears throat> to account for that, what we like to do is recommend that if you're, if you're growing a synthetic program, to take the dilution rates that you're using and are successful with and cut them in half and, and use half as much nutrients. Of course, the added benefit, you know, right off the bat is you're using half the nutrients, but uh, people are getting as good or better results <clears throat> by doing that with the blue mats. And, and honestly, like, we have a bunch of folks out there uh, that, that just run cocoa and salt and, like, just crush it. Like, they, they come back and they're like, I I just didn't know we could grow like this. Um, another product, I think we might start carrying this, but we're not right at the moment. Uh, I like it a lot, though. And I think it's an awesome component to work with the Blue Mats is this uh, um, fertilizer product called Beanstalk, Beanstalk Ag, if you heard about them. They're, that's a synthetic it's a synthetic program, too, but it's like these little <clears throat> pellets. They kind of look like, like nerds or something like that. Actually, yeah, it's just sort of a... We were doing some R&D, but it's like these just little pellets, and you mix that in with the soil, and it's it's like a time-release fertilizer, but it's specifically designed to uh, 
kind of like work with the grow cycles for, you know, um, the most common indoor medicinal plants that people grow. And so um, that works great with, with blue mats like the, the beanstalk does. We're, we've been doing some R&D with it because we were thinking about actually carrying it, which would be a big departure for us to carry a synthetic product. We're really um, <clears throat> geared towards organic and sustainability and regenerative agriculture. So, um, But I just think it works so well that it's worth, you know, promoting a little bit um, as far as a, a synthetic program. I know there are some synthetics or some bottled nutrient lines, for example, that it could clog, right? It could clog things up. So the solution to that is PEC acid, which is like uh, drip clean. There's a product called drip clean. That's like super common. Just, yeah, using that like as directed on the bottles, that'll take care of all those issues and keep okay. your system clean. Um, you know, the distribution drippers is probably the weakest link in the blue mat system for nutrient buildup. <clears throat> But uh, so if you're doing a lot of plants off of nutrients, sometimes just like omit the distribution drippers and just drip right out of the tube uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a technique. <clears throat> um, Let's flip back into a few container sizes and then, and then we'll wrap things up. You know, we covered all the way up to, to seven gallons. Anything different for like 10 gallon pots, 15 gallon pots, 20 gallon pots, as far as how you would lay out the... The, the bigger pots... And again, like 15 gallons up is where I start looking at this. You know, a 10-gallon pot, maybe you want to sink a 9-inch carrot in there in addition. So like a nice kind of deluxe setup for that or, or higher end setup is, you know, it would be a 5-inch carrot with like, say, five distribution drippers around the outside edge of the pot. The distribution drippers would, would, would water. And then you take a second 9-inch carrot and sink it right near the base of the plant. So, so the outer ring uh the outer outer you know outer edge of the pot is is being monitored by the five inch carrot and and then the and then there's just one single distrip, uh, drip point near the base of the plant that's being monitored you know being monitored by the the nine inch and that kind of mimics that like inverse pyramid that uh a root mass tends to you know you take a plant out and shake it and you notice that there's generally like a lot of roots on the top and then there's like the tap root down the middle so if you look at the, the root mass of the plant, it kind of looks like that inverse pyramid. So we're measuring um, soil moisture kind of in, in you know, in, uh, that corresponds to that structure. Um, so that's, for, that's nice for a 10-gallon, 9-inch in the middle, and then 5-inch <clears throat> uh, with 5 drippers. Um, and then, yeah, once we get 15 and above, you know, having a little piece of that blue soak on one carat is great. You know, it really gives nice, super even coverage. And then the bigger the pots we get, you know, we get into <clears throat> 30s, 45s, 65s, 100s, 200s, whatever. Really, it's just usually a big spiral of that blue spoke. So, because that stuff, we can turn corners with it. It doesn't kink. Um, so we can just do like one big spiral. And, you know, soil dries out and nice even layer of water gets laid down on top of it. How about some of the common beds? Like I know a lot of folks are like 3x3 three three bed, 4x4 four four bed, 5x5 five five bed. Yeah. What would you do for those? Well, you could still do the, um, you know, you, with, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, like three by three, four by four, you can still do that spiral kind of shape if you wanted to with a carrot. And then kind of over that, we use this double manifold system where basically <clears throat> the carrot feeds into a little header of this eight millimeter tubing. And then off of that are four lines of drip, of drip soak, of the uh, blue soak, the um, soaker hose. So one carrot can, you know, basically is controlling uh, four eight foot lines that like on a four by eight bed, for instance, you know, you'd have a <clears throat> one carrot that when, when it turns on, it feeds into a little header and that header waters four eight foot lines that run the length of the bed. And um, well, actually, sometimes we'll, we'll kind of mirror that structure on both sides of the bed. So you have two carrots and they both feed into the same system. So if either carrot dries out, it turns on the water and, and can and fill it. So you're kind of monitoring a couple different places in the bed with a, maybe a nine inch and a five inch but yeah the double manifold bed is that's how we water everything <clears throat> from like four by four four by eight up because again a lot of these guys are growing in like you know four by 90s or four by 120 even or something like that um <clears throat> in big greenhouses or big indoor applications and then those we just break up like oh every 10 feet there's like a, a zone you know down the row or whatever awesome
Well, we could sit here and talk for another three hours if we really wanted to, but yeah. we're going to end it here at the one hour mark. Tell us, how can the listeners find you and what do you have upcoming in the future? Yeah, um, let's see, a bunch of different stuff. We're uh, So first thing is if you go to the website, sustainablevillage.com, we do free design work for everybody. That's another thing I forgot to mention. Um, it, you know, So there's a quote request button uh, right on sustainablevillage.com, and it's free. You just put some information in there if you have a home garden that you want. Uh, an irrigation system designed for you hit the button you fill out a little form and um, one of our designers will get back to you really pretty quickly with like a drawing of the system a description of how it works and a complete parts list for everything you need for it and like no pressure to buy or anything like that so it's kind of a little service we do um, and have all the customer service and tech supports kind of back it up um, so if, yeah anybody's interested in a blue mat system they're curious about it, they can go down to sustainablevillage.com and Click on that quote request button. Um, what are we doing? I'm actually doing a trade show next week. It's a it's it's a ag traditional ag show. It's a Colorado farm show. Um, so that's up in Greeley, Colorado. It's just like a big traditional ag show. Um, I'm going out. There's a conference up in Southern Humboldt. Um, there's really pretty impressive lineup of, of people there. Um, I was really honored they asked me to come speak. So I'm going to do a presentation there on just irrigation all kinds of irrigation techniques and stuff there. Um, so I'll be out at that one. <clears throat> um, yeah, that's what we do. You know, we, we have our offices here in Boulder, Colorado, so, um, and a couple warehouses just stacked to the gills with uh, irrigation parts. Um, so we'll design systems, and then, you know, we, we sell the parts to go along with them. Um, and check us out there. You can check us out at uh, on Instagram. Uh, Blue Mat Watering Systems is our main one. What, most people find the most interesting. That's B L U M A T. That's Blue Mat B L U M A T watering systems, and then Sustainable Village <coughs> on Instagram too. Great stuff there for sure. If you enjoyed this video, click that thumbs up button. I'm trying to get as many thumbs up as possible it helps with the YouTube algorithm. And uh, we're releasing these episodes every single week, so subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you're listening on one of the podcast platforms, particularly Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating and review. Coming up on 200, 200 ratings and reviews. So hopefully we can get there within the next month or so. Thank you to everyone who has left a rating and review so far. Michael, thanks again for coming on. This has been awesome. Definitely answered a lot of questions that I had. And I'm sure that it's definitely helped some folks that are that are tuning into this. So thank you for your time. And I yeah. hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Anytime, man. Uh, just let me know if you guys have any more questions. I'm happy to jump back on whatever you need. Sounds good. Thank you.